Aloha and welcome to Global Connections. I'm your host, Carlos Juarez, and we've got a great conversation today. I'm going to be talking with a guest uh, joining me, a colleague here at the University of the Americas Puebla in Mexico. It's uh, Professor Sam Stone, who teaches law here at the university. Uh, he's a law professor in Mexico, and yet, as we'll hear a little bit more of his own background, he's recently relocated from the U.S. He's uh, grown up uh, in many ways, like myself, bicultural, uh, Mexican heritage, but uh, educated and, and growing up in the U.S., but now in Mexico, helping train uh, the next generation of young leaders, uh, law lawyers, if you will. And so we're going to unravel a conversation that's going to help us understand more about some of the challenges, some of the issues, uh, some of the puzzles, and, and maybe surprises of what it is like teaching uh, in Mexico, uh, teaching uh, young university students, and also just uh, some differences about the, the legal profession, uh, the legal you know education itself. So uh, on that, let me welcome you first, Sam. Thank you so much for joining me here. On Global Connections, it's great to have you. Hi, Carlos. Thanks for having me. This is great. Great to be with you guys here. And Sam, uh, you know, for our listeners, uh, uh, maybe just give us a quick snapshot. You've been in Mexico now this past year, since the beginning of 2019, uh, yeah. roughly. Uh, tell us a little bit what brought you here, where you came from. And Yeah, so I've actually been back in Mexico now for three years. Uh -huh. I've been here at the university uh, since January. Uh, I was born in Chicago, Illinois. I grew up there for four years, and I lived in Mexico eight years as a kid, then in Ohio for nine years, then in D.C., <laughs> And then back here. So uh -huh. it's been a little bit of a, a little crazy tour. But, yeah. but in many ways, bi bicultural, bi yeah. national, uh, yeah. uh, bilingual, and, and crossing borders rather seamlessly. Uh, we live in a time of considerable mobility, this yeah. globalization of the world, and indeed uh, on global connections here, we try to connect people to the world, but also just show how the world, sometimes whether you leave it or not, it comes to you, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, my, my mom was born and raised in Mexico City, uh, mm -hmm. educated there. My dad's from Green Bay, Wisconsin originally, you know, so we're sort of all over. Yeah, you know they met back in the '80s, and you know they're still connected today. So that's how that works. And tell me uh, some of your educational background. You did your undergraduate studies. Where was this at? Uh, yeah, I did everything in the states. I, I went to Baldwin Wallace University, mm -hmm. which is a small liberal arts college in uh, Berea, Ohio, mm -hmm. southwest of Cleveland. Okay. Uh, it was my bachelor's was in international relations and political science, double major, yeah. minor in history. Uh, and then I took a couple years off, year and a half off, in between that and the JD. Then I went to the George Washington University mm -hmm. uh, in D.C. Washington, D.C. Uh, from that uh, law experience uh, after law school, you went on to do some, well, some work in the, in the field as, as, a, as a young lawyer. Yeah. Uh, and this was also in the D.C. area? Yeah, I was, I was in D.C. for two years after that. Mm -hmm. I clerked for uh, three judges on D.C. Superior Court, which is okay. D.C.'s local trial court, yes. uh, for, for two whole years, mm -hmm. doing all criminal cases, which was, which was pretty interesting. Uh, but also during and right after law school, I uh, interned for did summer associate positions with a uh, big law firm in D.C., Clear Gottlieb, and then also with the U.S. Attorney's Office in the District mm -hmm. of Columbia and with another uh, federal district court. Oh, excellent. So really a uh, practical yeah. experience, obviously, coming yeah. out of law school, getting your hands dirty and, and understanding the criminal justice system from the inside. Yeah. Uh, and as we continue, uh, after we talk a little first about maybe more the legal profession and legal education, I'd like us to also maybe talk about some of the comparison and contrast of the, the criminal justice system. Yeah. Uh, the United States, of course, itself facing a lot of, you know, challenges, criticism, need for, oh, yeah. you know, reform. But Mexico, and one thing that uh, is always interesting about the case of Mexico, uh, on paper and maybe in general structure, it has a political system quite similar to the U.S., a federal system with states, a separation of powers, three branches. But uh, we'll continue to talk about that. Uh, the reality is often a little different. Uh, Mexico is a newer democracy, a fledgling democracy, still trying to consolidate. Uh, the U.S., of course, although it has problems these days, a few steps back, but it is clearly one of the longest, uh, you know, continually established yeah. democracies. And that that heritage, that history, obviously, says something about the U.S. system. So we'll look to compare those. But maybe beginning with uh, just your insights and, and, and a quick overview as well. You are now here teaching law as yeah. a law professor. And, um, and one of the things maybe to, to speak about is, how is the education here in, the, in Mexico for, for lawyers fundamentally different? Maybe the, the quick version that you can clarify is, in the U.S., you go to law school after you've done undergraduate studies. Right. Uh, and here in Mexico, you begin it right as the beginning of an undergraduate degree, yeah. and you do it exclusively. It's also common in, in a lot of other countries in Europe and, and maybe different areas of the world. Uh, but describe a little bit the general contrast, uh, the, the differences of the, of the legal education as you, as you know it now. Sure, yeah. I mean, I think actually in the States, we're probably... I don't know if we're the only country, but we're, we're one of the only countries that does law as a degree after a bachelor's degree, mm -hmm. or at least that is, you know, a long period of time, three whole years of yeah. additional study. The postgraduate bachelor's uh, yeah. degree. Right? I mean, and, and, and here yeah. again, the bachelor's degree for many in the U.S., 
there's no set specific one. It can right. vary. Uh, common might be uh, political science right. as a degree. Sometimes it could be philosophy or English. You can come from uh, anything. You could be a biology major and yep. decide it may take you a little extra preparation, but frankly, it, it means that those getting into the U.S. law school really have a more, maybe a broader and more diverse uh, educational background. Absolutely. For example, yeah. at GW, uh, you know, they're very focused on international law and also on patent law, IP law in general. Mm -hmm. And they're actually the best university, the best school in the country for that. Mm -hmm. So I actually went to law school with a lot of engineers, folks who had ah, their bachelor's okay. degree sometimes, master's degree in engineering, because yeah. they'd come to law school and they'd say, hey, I have all this technical and scientific mm -hmm. knowledge about how patents work. And now I want to learn the legal side sure. and go into that. And it's very yeah. lucrative in the States. And uh, yeah, so you have a broad base of folks, right? You have people who uh, you know, are in the classics, for example. I have a friend who studied yeah. you know, Greek and Latin literature mm -hmm. for yeah. four years, and then he came to law school. So that's sort of how it works in the States. Here in Mexico, it's completely different. Right? You come in straight from high school. Usually you're 18 years old. Uh, the program is set up to be four or five years, depending mm -hmm. on the university, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, some students take longer because they either go on exchange programs mm -hmm. and then you know, they don't count those, some of those courses. Yeah. Different reasons. but. The programs are four or five, four or five years. years is typical, but, it, but it's entirely you're you're basically a law student for that entire yeah period. right. So in Mexico, so in Mexico, like in also a lot of countries, uh, there is no sort of most most universities don't have a common core right, or there isn't mm -hmm. uh, uh, courses that you can take because you want to take them. Mm -hmm. You have to take a predetermined set of courses right from the first semester all the way to the last semester, mm -hmm. and so you're pretty much taking law courses all the way through. So yeah. you have four or five full years of only taking law courses. Mm -hmm. Many semesters also, instead of taking four or five courses like we do in the States, students will take six or seven. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'll even take more courses yeah. in a semester. Uh, and so they end up with somewhere between like 50 and 60 courses, basically mm -hmm. law courses yeah. Yeah. over the course of this period. So they graduate as lawyers and they can practice, right? When they finish in 22 mm -hmm. or 23 or 24, coming out of their bachelor's degree year, they can practice as lawyers, right? They have to. Now, is there an exam process here? I mean, to, to actually get yeah. your, to get your right. let's say, certificate of uh, uh, your cedula, as they might call it. Uh, right. Like in the U.S., generally you would call it passing the bar. Yeah. You're going to be getting certified right. by the deal. state. Uh, so it's one thing to go to law school. Then you got to right. pass this big hurdle. Right. Uh, similar here, there's obviously a, a final okay. sort of tail end. Yeah, process. but it's, it's not at the same uh, level. You know, in the okay. States, you can have your bachelor's and your J.D., you could get you know perfect grades all the way through and with honors and everything, but if you don't pass that bar exam, you can't you practice get, as a lawyer. Practice, yeah. right? Maybe you can get jobs consulting. Sure, maybe you sure. can get jobs yeah. in some sort of legal related things, yeah. but you can't actually be the person on the legal document that's mm -hmm. going to court. You can't appear yeah. in front of the judges, right, in a courtroom, uh, and that's pretty intense, right? I think sure. most people are at least familiar with the bar exam, and it's different in different states in the U.S. Yeah. But it's a and you take it by state, so to be yeah. able to practice law in. Right. Washington, D.C., and California. Right, you have Ohio. to take it in each state. The only one you can wade into uh, pretty much very easily is D.C. So if, you, if you're barred anywhere else in the country, you uh, think D.C. will okay. take you. But other states sometimes have agreements. So if you're barred in one state, like Wisconsin, I think Minnesota, Minnesota. one other. <laughs> yeah, they have, they have surely, some Surely the Dakotas must be a in sync. I mean, uh... they, they, I thought it might be. I don't I remember. But, but there are some yeah. ways. But, but yes, you're barred state by state. Yeah. So in Mexico, there are two big differences. One is that when you are admitted to practice after your bachelor's degree, mm -hmm. it's national. So there's no mm -hmm. restriction by state. Uh, by state. Yeah. Some states are starting to talk about having additional requirements, but uh, it's national, even mm -hmm. though Mexico is a federal country. And the second thing is that the process here, you have to you know, get your degree. Uh, you have to, uh, many universities do a, a, they call it social service, yeah. which is like a national it's sort a of service It's a mandatory service that is. Sometimes yeah. it's done during the degree, and yep. uh, often they might put it off towards the tail end, but yep. it's kind of a practical internship of sorts, yeah. uh, part of the program or the curriculum, if you will, but uh, it's a way of giving back to, as well, but also giving you practical professional Absolutely. experience. Absolutely. Yeah. But once you've pretty much done all of that and you come through, you can get your cedula. You can get, and that's sort of the, the document. Like credential that, that, that gives yeah. you the legal right to right. exercise that profession. Right. Uh, it's common in many others as an engineer, as a, you know, many... Yep other um, practical uh, practitioner type degree programs. And, you know, I wonder maybe if you could say a few words about maybe the role of lawyers. I mean, in the U.S., of course, we have, and, and I imagine here as well, lawyers who go into many different practices, corporate law, right. you know, public defenders, uh, maybe people dealing with environmental issues, you know, the music industry, or, you know, entertainment yep. lawyers, whatever it might be. 
uh, people go on to exercise. And is it fair to say those coming out of law school, most of them continue to practice as lawyers? Uh, because there may be some who, I don't know, maybe become entrepreneurs or yep. consultants. But a fair percentage go on to actually exercise as, as lawyers in, in yeah. many areas, right? Yeah, I, I don't actually have like a concrete percentage, mm -hmm. but uh, my impression both in the States and in Mexico is that most graduates of the law school uh, go on to practice, sure. right? Mm -hmm. uh, there are people who go to law school or they're you know, studying law because they want to go into politics. Yeah. That's pretty common or both in the States, yeah. right? Yeah. Or uh, you know they want to work in their family business, maybe. Yeah. And the business is it's not really legal, but they're going to do some legal work there, mm -hmm. right? So there are folks who end up not practicing, but most, most I think most want, want to practice yeah. and, and they will practice. And so, uh, yeah, there's a broad range of fields. I think in the US, there are some areas that are much more developed like IP, mm -hmm. uh, also for example, compliance, right? And IP is intellectual property. Intellectual or, property, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Intellectual property mm -hmm. law, right? Which can be both patents, but also copyright. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another field that in the States is, is pretty big, especially in DC, but everywhere. Is compliance is the idea of you know, yeah. being a lawyer who either in-house or through a firm uh, make sure that companies are in compliance with all the rules and regulations and with all that's the, new here yeah, right it's yeah, it's, yeah. it's a growing area it's, it's and even the concept of the idea uh, yeah. and, and as we i often find too i've been myself teaching some years in mexico and one of the things as a political science professor i've often had difficulty i don't know i'm going to throw this out to you but there's the word that we have in the U.S. of accountability. Mm -hmm. It's not accounting, which is right, you know right, accounting right, pressure, but it's accountability that has more ethical, legal, uh, you know, sort of, uh, uh, or even moral dimensions. That is, you have to be accountable for your actions. And what I'm getting at is, often that word you can't translate it literally into Spanish. Yeah. It's not contabilidad, which right, is right. Like account, accounting. accounting. Yeah. Uh, and and partly it's because maybe even the notion of there's more impunity here. There's maybe a less uh, compliance. In fact, yeah. uh, and even yeah. why is there? impunity, why, why do people not pay taxes or whatever? Well, partly because it's got a weaker state uh, in some ways yeah. uh, and, and, and more difficulty enforcing uh, enforcing the laws. Yeah. Um, I wonder maybe uh, continuing from that, uh, you know, what would you describe? I mean, because on one hand, Mexico uh, as a, you know, as a country where uh, it has a higher percentage of the population in, let's say, in poverty or lower socioeconomic, yeah. maybe half uh, easily. Yeah. And what I'm getting at here is that the university students really are more so than in the U.S., they're really a small elite here, yeah. especially those studying law school or a yeah. private institution. So, I mean, in the U.S., uh, we have a world now where today, compared to 50 or 100 years ago, a higher percentage of people going to university, yeah. which is a good thing in general. It's a challenge sometimes because there are some who may not be prepared or don't have yeah. even, you know, experience from parents who have gone to college, mm -hmm. so different challenges as first generation. Uh, here in Mexico, we have a lot of other maybe challenges to social mobility is what I want to get yeah. at. I think in the U.S. there's a bit more of this yeah. openness. If you work hard, if you get the right education, you have the ability to move into yeah. different social status. At, at least at least some people do, right? Yeah, I mean, we, 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 we like to think we do in the States, and I think we used to more, and it's yeah, becoming yeah. less. It's, but here it just is it's almost non-existent. That's right. There's I mean, less of that social yeah. mobility. There's more of a class structure. Yeah, there's pretty much uh, no, there's, and, pretty, there's, yeah. there's very little space to move up social in your socioeconomic level in Mexico. Classes are very marked, right? As you know, yeah. class, uh, we don't talk about classes about as much in the States. Classes in, in, we're not talking about courses, we're talking about yeah, yeah. social classes. Yeah, so, socioeconomic yes. classes, yeah. right? Much so in the States, fixed. in the States, they, I think, are are pretty marked, but we don't see them, you don't see them as much yeah. on the street, yeah. right? Yeah. And here in Mexico, you can pretty much, by looking at people, can often tell yeah. sort of where in the general socioeconomic level. So it's very ingrained in society, number one. Number two, there is very, there's very little room, I think, to move up pretty much if you were born into a middle class, you're likely to stay there. Maybe you can get into an upper class. But if you're born in that 50% or so of the country that is in some level of uh, poverty, poverty yeah, really, you're pretty much yeah. not going to get out, right? It's going to be very challenging. Uh, so yeah, especially at a university like this, which is a private university, it's expensive by Mexican standards. Uh, yeah, yeah. So a lot of the good. students we have are, are sort of coming from an elite sort of level. And, and I get, but I guess that regardless of that, some of these problems you were talking about, the impunity and the corruption, and the sort of the, the circle that that creates, those kind of apply, I think, across the board. I think, unfortunately, yeah. it's permeated Mexican society yeah. at all levels. Yeah. And even equal though, opportunity. Yeah, yeah let me, let me, that's the one area where there is equal that's opportunity. That's right. Let, corruption you know, uh, Sam, let me hold you on that thought because we're going to take a very yeah. quick break right now for a short uh, intermission, and we'll come back to continue this conversation. Great. I'm here talking today with Sam Stone, uh, the professor of law here at the University of the Americas Puebla in Mexico. And we're gonna return with more on the conversation. Uh, join us here. Thank you. 
Aloha, I'm Catherine Knorr, and I'm the host of Much More on Medicine on ThinkTech Hawaii. We talk about medical issues, and I interview guests regarding medical matters, and I'm really excited about upcoming guests. I hope you join us every other Wednesday at 3 p.m. Aloha, and see you then. Aloha. I'm Marsha Joyner, inviting you to join us on Wednesdays at 1 o'clock for Cannabis Chronicles, a 10,000-year odyssey where we take a look at cannabis as food, cannabis as medicine, cannabis and religion, and cannabis and dear old Uncle Sam. So please join us to learn all about cannabis. Again, Wednesdays at 1 o'clock. I thank you. I'm your host, Carlos Juarez, and we're talking today with Sam Stone, who is an American who, well, American of Mexican heritage, uh, Mexican-American, uh, but he's here in Mexico teaching uh, law, law school, and basically uh, educating and training the next generation of Mexican lawyers. Uh, and we're talking a little bit about some of the differences, some of the similarities, because clearly the U.S. has, you know, its own system, both of, of, of legal education, the legal profession. Uh, Mexico, curiously, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a country that is really a contrast, a paradox. You have on one hand parts of it very modern, very connected to the first world, very globalized, and you turn the corner and there's obviously underdevelopment, poverty, inequality uh, on a very serious level. It's a wealthy country uh, with resources and knowledge and whatnot, uh, manufacturing capacity, agricultural production, but it's also very poor in that yeah. half the population doesn't seem to yeah. benefit from it's that. It's a very wealthy country where wealth is terribly distributed. Right. A very I mean, unequal distribution of the wealth. Mexico's, yeah. Mexico's usually, you know, in terms of GDP, and I know GDP instead of GDP per capita is not always the best indicator, mm -hmm. right? But Mexico's GDP uh, is usually within the top 15 or so economies of the world, right? Out of 100, sure. you know, 95, 96, 98, however we want to define them, it's countries, top, yeah. right? So it's, so it's, it's a big It's deal. in the G20. It's, yep. a, it's a key player as, a, as an emerging power right. of sorts. But, but the wealth is terribly distributed. Yeah. You, know, you could even argue that NAFTA, for example, in free trade over the last 30 years, has created a lot of wealth for Mexico, and it just has not at all been distributed in any way that helps really pull people out of poverty mm -hmm. in, in a real sense, yeah. right? And so that, to some degree, in my in my view at least, plays into sort of the cycle of corruption and impunity, which affects all of yeah. society, and it sort of is a challenge on the legal system. That's right. Uh, and the legal system, to sort of mention about comparing it to the U.S., talking about mm -hmm. how it is different uh, from the U.S. So Mexico inherits a lot of its basic structure from the U.S., yeah, right? Yeah. The U.S. Constitution. Federal system, three branches yep, of government. Yep, separation of powers, presidential. right? Presidential. Things that weren't necessarily inherent in systems of government before the yeah, U.S., yeah, yeah. especially separation of powers and federalism. Uh, and so, yeah, Mexico basically looks at the U.S. Constitution, right? It becomes independent uh, 35 years uh, later, yeah, right? Yeah. And says, hey, we like some of these ideas, so we're going to institute it. Sure. And so the basic, the basic structure looks very similar from the outside. It has a constitution, right. it has Britain, a Congress, a presidency. Yep, three branches of government, right? Mm -hmm. Executive and president, mm -hmm. uh, the, the legislature with two houses of the legislature chamber, that are pretty much the same thing, right? A chamber House of deputies and the Senate, and the yeah. Senate right? Mm -hmm. the Supreme Court, which is independent. There's a you know, judiciary branch, the states. Uh, it's a federal constitution explicitly. The states retain uh, some power. Powers, right, yeah. it's, it's a lot weaker. Than beyond that states. paper yeah. being, I mean, in Mexico, has a longer history of an authoritarian system. And only in right. the last maybe 30, 35 years, it's been becoming it's, more democratic, making significant progress, but also a few steps back, like right. always happens. And these days, maybe a growing anxiety because people see change, but then they see injustice and equality. Right. There are new rules and, and impressive, uh, you know, very progressive uh, reforms of, of the legal, you know, yeah. constitution. But in reality, uh, if you're a very poor person in Mexico, you don't have a system that is there working for you as well. Yeah, it's, you have wealth and money, you can right. find the right way. Yeah, it, it's difficult to, I think, to live in Mexico if you are poor, right? Which is most people, not just because of the physical sort of material conditions, but because you're looking at, you know, all of this wealth around you that's not distributed. You're looking at all of this modernity to some degree. Sure. And then you go home and you're living in sort of these conditions that in some places, you know, could probably not be out of place in like Marx's descriptions of, uh, Manchester, England in sure. the 19th century, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, that that's sort of that bad. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that also, like you're saying, plays into the legal system because 
the system is in some ways less adversarial than in the United States. Mm -hmm. There's more of an emphasis on conciliation and on sort of even in the criminal system, you know, the parties kind of sort of have the victim and the, and the, and the perpetrator, or the family of the victim trying to come together, right, and have a, have a dialogue. Uh, but unfortunately, there's just such a high level of impunity. Only about 2% of crimes yeah. in Mexico ever get resolved, 2%, right? And, uh, and, and, and I mean, that sounds just by itself, it's like, wow, something's not working. I mean, the U.S. system, not perfect, of course, with its own issues, but I yeah. mean, what would be a, a contrast, for example? What percentage of crimes get to their final you know, conviction or, or, or go through the process? Yeah, I actually don't have the number. But it's certainly not two or three. It's, it's, very, it's be, very high, right? Be a, the vast majority stance. of crimes are at least investigated. Yeah. In the United States. Whereas here, they never quite make it in. They often don't even get investigated, yeah, right? I mean, no. so they might call the police, they might show up, they might take a few notes, and then that's where that ends, yeah. right? In some cases, if you really want to pursue a case, you might have to uh, provide additional personal funds to the police sure. to make sure that they yeah, actually the investigate. Wheel, yeah. That up. Yeah. And that, and Which is crazy. It is, right? and, and, and it, it helps to erode trust in the system, legitimacy, yeah. confidence, credibility, right. everything. And, and the U.S. is imperfect, right? I mean, yeah. it has serious, serious problems. I, I, I worked in the criminal justice system for two years in D.C. I was a law mm -hmm. clerk to judges in D.C., as I mentioned. And uh, I, I am personally convinced that sort of this theory that the U.S. criminal justice system is structurally, has racist issues on a structural mm -hmm. level, mm -hmm. is true. I mean, I, and that's not to say that I think most people in the system are racist, not at all. On the contrary, I think most people are trying to do, they do what they think is right, but it's built up in such a way that it's going to pull in all these people who are black and brown, pretty much, and um, far higher rates than whites. And that's going, you know, that is a real problem, right? There was yeah. Michelle Alexander's book, uh, The New Jim Crow, that kind of puts this whole thing into perspective. And I think that's our biggest challenge in the States. But the, but the general notion of how it works, I think, is good. Mm -hmm. The problem is it's been structured yeah, yeah. in a way that has been uh, not well, beneficial. I, mean, I don't know if it's minorities. the term of an institutional racism, but they are a legacy of obviously decisions yeah. and rules made by a very right. you know, narrow set of the, let's say, of the, yeah. and, and, and the system is set up that way. Yeah. To somehow it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's not de, de jure, you know, it's not like legal. It's, I'm not saying, of course, yeah. there's it's not a legal segregation. Yeah, right, right, right. right. Puts them, right. That, that right. was the reality right. before right. the That's 60s. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, civil rights uh, reforms and all. Uh, and I wonder, uh, you know, maybe just a quick uh, thought of after now you've been here some time of understanding a deeper knowledge, you, you come from the U.S., so you know that system well, but now as you're more familiar with the system here, are there anything that you can think of that like really surprised you or that's done interest very different uh, and anything from maybe something that rather actually could help the U.S. or that otherwise is simply a different way of doing things here yeah. that... Uh, or, or even as you are educating your students here, they are pretty well-to-do upper middle-class Mexicans, but they're also socialized where they have a knowledge and understanding of the U.S. Yeah. After all, the U.S. has this tremendous power. So people often see popular culture, music, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, film, the television, right. and they may assume certain things. You know, you have the right to remain silent, your Miranda rights. Right. Well, those right. are the U.S. That's right. not Mexico. Yep. Uh, and any uh, anything you could share, like little yeah. subtle differences or... Yeah, so, so I, I guess there are actually a bunch of things potentially. Uh, but one of the things I think that I like about here is that there is more of an emphasis in the legal system on cooperation and on mediation. It's not automatically it's adversarial, adversarial right? Said, yeah. In the U.S., it's always adversarial. Yeah, yeah. And that works in some ways, and in many ways. But uh, I think sometimes that can yeah. be... So it may protect temporary. you if you are a, you know, a contract uh, you know, to enforce it. Right. But it creates almost this tension inherently, yeah. and even you can almost describe that. Perhaps you you can appreciate this relations between usually, uh, you know, the owners, managers, and and the workers. It's yeah. it's a more tense and adversarial one. Yeah. I know, for example, that in, in a lot of the European countries, particularly northern European, they have a labor management relations that's almost inherently cordial, more right. cooperative, and, right. and and you know they sit down to solve problems rather than wait until you know they, they're, not, they're not talking to each yeah. other. So that aspect, I think, this yeah. more participatory, more idea of, of, of being more towards mediation, solving the problem, yeah. right? There's also, I think Mexico is much more, and Mexicans in general, including our students here and our colleagues and so on, just much more international than in the United States, and, and at least in law. Yeah. Lawyers yeah. in the United States are not required to take international law yeah. at all yeah. while they're in law school, most of them. Some law schools require it. But also, they uh, there's a lot of uh, sort of poo-pooing of international law. This idea, oh, it's not real law because it, it's not enforced in this sort of yeah. hard traditional way sure. to think of. Like there's no police force, right? That's yeah. going to show up and you know tell 
whatever country to do the, what it should yeah. be doing. Uh, and that leads a lot of American lawyers to kind of say, oh, well, then it doesn't matter, right? Sure. It's not yeah. real. Uh, whereas in Mexico, that's not really the case. Like, I think most people, uh, most people in law, at least, accept the notion that international law is part of Mexican law because mm -hmm. it is under Mexico system. Sure. They accept the notion of human rights, including social and economic mm -hmm. rights, as human rights, right? Yeah. That's not really in question that much anymore in the Mexican uh, you know, legal system. And of course, in Mexico, it doesn't always get applied that well, mm -hmm. but on paper, right, yeah. the Mexican constitution has been amended to include all of these social and economic rights, yeah. but in the U.S., you know, at least half of the country still you know, doesn't or don't see it as a right at all, right? And I think from that perspective, uh, that, that's pretty interesting how that's developed yeah. so differently. Now, in the U.S., the rights that people do have are usually implemented in a much better way, and they're actually, you know, you can actually exercise your human rights, whereas uh, here in Mexico, oftentimes, you can't. So Mexico has this great system on paper, and, you know, hopefully, eventually, we can implement it, right? But the U.S. could learn, I think, take some of that from Mexico and say, hey, there's no reason why we can't see some of these things as rights. There's no reason why we can't integrate international law into our own law without ceding sovereignty, right? The argument is always, oh, it's, you know, the U.S. is going to lose sovereignty and it becomes more involved yeah, in these yeah, international turning. institutions. Yeah. And that doesn't have to be the case at, at all, I think. And so that's a model from Mexico that the U.S. could look at. Yeah. I, think it's yeah, I, I find it fascinating. And, and as I think about it now, yeah, in the U.S., most lawyers and law school, they really aren't learning about international no. law because it's not central to what they're doing all year. Right. And yet, as you know, I'm in the area more of international relations and foreign policy, and obviously international law is central to that, understanding yep. human rights violations, yep. uh, you know, sovereignty issues of states and territorial claims. But that's a very narrow area that's just, you know, for some. Yeah. And nevertheless, like you were saying here, Mexican lawyers, and I would think too, I mean, lawyers in other parts of the world have to be more connected to what's happening in legal issues, doing business across borders. Yep. Uh, and, you know, for Mexico, the United States is such an important all important player, the main, you know, economic partner. And, uh, you know, again, even if you never leave Mexico to the U, go to the U.S., the U.S. is here and breathing on you yeah, all the and, time. and investing and, and, and pushing, you know, trade wars, whatever it might be. And maybe more specifically, people here, educated, uh, you know, young leaders need an understanding of the American system, uh, Absolutely. the legal system, yeah. the political system uh, that helps inform, you know, them to understand how to do business, how to, and also how to make sense of, of the way U.S. thinks. hundred uh, percent. I think if you're going to be a professional person in Mexico, yeah. almost regardless of what area you're in, you need to understand and, and how work, the U.S. works. And a working knowledge of work English to be able to communicate Absolutely. effectively. Uh, there's a final thought I, I have as we, you know, had a great chance to contrast some of these things. But one thing I know that I often hear this from Mexicans looking towards the U.S., the United States has this obsession with suing everybody and going to court over everything and if you know if, if uh, my tire got broken then the city has to pay yeah. whatever might and and you know of course takes on different levels but in general there is a sense in the u.s that that's what lawyers do they just I, find yeah. ways to you know collect money from somebody with deep pockets today it might be the the pharmacy industry or the tobacco in the past yeah. or, or again making sure that you're holding accountable public officials yeah. or private companies. So so this is, and this is, I guess, my, my thought on this. I was just talking with students about this yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, this is one thing I do like about the U.S. legal system. I like mm -hmm. that it is relatively easy to bring a lawsuit. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the more barriers you put up uh, to bring the lawsuit in the first place, the less you're actually going to be able to hold people accountable mm -hmm. who should be held accountable, right? Yeah. I mean, asbestos, seatbelts, yeah, right? Yeah. Those are things in the U.S. that were only achieved, limiting asbestos with construction and putting seatbelts in cars. Mm -hmm because of lawsuits. Sure. It wasn't something uh, that states on their own were the federal, they, right, yeah. or the government didn't mandate it. I mean, yeah. For many years, those, those things were not mandated by government. Companies simply said, hey, we're going to start doing this because otherwise we'll get sued and we'll lose, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, McDonald's coffee case, right? Someone yeah. Burn their hand. Burn their hand. But if you uh, actually go and look at it, that was actually a real case, right? The coffee yeah. was much hotter than it should have been. The mm -hmm. person was actually injured. And the point is, having worked for judges, I can tell you that if a lawsuit comes in that's completely frivolous, the judge will toss it. I mean, you know, the other side yeah. will make a motion, it'll be tossed, it'll be done, right? So while sometimes you do see these cases, right, that make the news of, yeah. you know, oh, someone sues because they put their cat in the microwave and they should have known better, you know, you know, they're suing the microwave company anyway. That stuff does happen, but to me, that's a price that sort of I'm willing to pay to make sure that people can bring their lawsuits in the first place hold people accountable, both government yeah. and industry, uh, when they need to. Yeah. 
Well, Sam, uh, you know, we're, we've just scratched the surface of this. I want to yeah. say, you know, we'll keep our conversation going, have opportunities to continue the dialogue. But this has been very fascinating just to get a snapshot of your own insights and experience uh, coming to teach law here in Mexico, uh, train the next generation and help them understand the U.S. as well, because you've got yeah. uh, insights into that and it's necessary for them here. Uh, well, we're going to have to close on that. It's been a great conversation. I again look forward to continuing it. We'll, we'll open some other uh, areas to, to push towards. And my host, I'm sorry, my guest here, I'm your host, Carlos Juarez. Uh, glad that you could join us here, get a little insight into understanding uh, this important relationship, Mexico and the U.S., uh, in, in, in areas of education and, and understanding the future lawyers who are going to always be around. You need a lawyer, like it or not, they're going to have to help us uh, sift through everything. So we're going to close on that. Thank you for joining us. And We'll look forward to seeing you here on our next episode of Global Connections.